My name is Bruce Stanton. I'm the director of the Dartmouth Superfund program for the last 10 years. Um, I'm at Dartmouth uh, College and our Superfund research programs, uh, one of our main goals is to investigate uh, the, the adverse health effects of arsenic and to get people in the states of Maine and New Hampshire to test their wells and to remediate the arsenic so that they reduce exposure to this very toxic metal. The Dartmouth Superfund program has been studying arsenic for over 20 years, 25 years, and our research has been focused on looking at the health or adverse health effects of arsenic, um, primarily on lung infections in, in my laboratory. Here in the state of Maine, for example, there was a study recently published that showed um, arsenic in well water reduced the IQ of uh, young children um, by about uh, 10 points, which is a pretty significant uh, decrease. So there's changes in IQ, there's changes in just about increased incidence of cancer, um, breast cancer, lung cancer, and um, uh, low birth weight, and, and t really too many adverse effects to mention. Just about every organ system in the body is associated um, with disease if exposed to enough arsenic. My specific research is looking at how arsenic affects um, lung infections. Usually low levels of arsenic that people in Maine and New Hampshire are exposed to but in and of itself doesn't have much of an effect, but when you, say, get um, a bacterial infection of your lung or a viral infection of your lung, you get a worse infection that lasts longer. You also tend to get more infections, and we're interested in understanding why that happens. We're also doing some studies now that are really exciting where we're looking at the transgenerational effects. And what we're seeing is, is that moms who are, and, and actually these are studies in mice, but um, Mice who are exposed to um, arsenic when they're pregnant, their pups then get worse viral infections. And then looking out two and three generations, um, that exposure to arsenic actually is transgenerational, so it lasts three generations. So if a pregnant mom is drinking arsenic, her pups, her pups' pups, and her pups' pups' pups will still have um, adverse health effects from drinking that arsenic. So the problem is actually much worse than just the person ingesting the arsenic. As you know, you and I have been working on the state of Maine, school teachers on the state of New Hampshire, working with secondary school teachers for a number of years. We also go, we work with uh, the Department of Environmental Sciences in both states, New Hampshire and Maine. Um, we work with um, a number of, of other groups um, to increase awareness of, of the issue of arsenic in well water um, and trying to encourage people to test their wells and helping them develop ways to remediate and remove the arsenic from the water so to reduce exposure, which is really important. We're partnering with a number of additional um, high schools that we weren't partnering with before. And one of the unique aspects of this new program is that we're partnering with local college faculty, college professors near these local high schools um, for them to work together with the science teachers. So there's a lot more direct interaction than was possible previously because both MDIBL and Dartmouth are sort of remote to some of these sites. So I think that's a real big addition um, that really expands how many people we can reach out to and hopefully get interested not only in science, but get them to, to test their well and then remediate their well to reduce their arsenic exposure. I think the SEPA program is gonna be important because often adults will say, well, I've been drinking the arsenic water for 20 years and I'm fine, there's no effect. Um, and by the way, sometimes it takes 20 years of exposure for that effect to be manifest. But when people, when their kids, school kids, come home and, and talk to their parents and say, I've learned in school that this exposure, especially for young people, um, can lead to um, increased disease, the parents tend to listen more and they tend to do more testing and more remediation because, like all parents, we want to protect our kids. And I think that's another special um, aspect of the SEPA program, um, bringing the kids into it um, to convince the adults that they should test their water and remediate if the wells are positive for arsenic. 
I think it's a great collaboration between the MDI Biological Laboratory and Dartmouth, and we both have unique um, skills and experiences, but together um, we're a much stronger team than, than if we just did this work on our own. And so I think it's the, it's the teamwork and the collaboration between the two institutions that's really going to have a much bigger impact than if we just did it alone. So I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the problem with arsenic. Um, so just a little bit to start about just water quality in general. Um, you, everybody knows about the, uh, the problem with uh, the uh, federal emergency over the Flint uh, water contamination, where they changed water source. And that led to leaching of lead from lead pipes into the water supply. Um, when the water actually left the, the water um, treatment plant, it was fine. But because it, the water was more corrosive than previously, it leached the lead out. And it was a problem for many years until it was recognized. And the next several slides that I'm going to show you um, will reveal, probably not to anybody's surprise, that this is a bigger problem than just in Flint. Um, just a couple things. 20 schools in Massachusetts um, districts had high levels of lead in water. And you can see there are some uh, water fountains in public schools where the water, <coughs> the lead was leaching into the water in these, these fountains for, for um, our school children. Um, Cape Cod um, has a serious um, water problem. The Otis Air Force Base um, leaches a lot of these uh, jet fuel contaminates into the aquifer. Cape Cod is just a big sandbar, and the, the, um, these pollutants um, cause terrible issues with water quality and public water supplies in, at the Cape. So just a little background, Safe Drinking Water Act in 1974, it's a federal law to ensure safe drinking water. It applies to um, EPA set standards in, in overseas water suppliers. <coughs> it applies to um, about 155,000 um, public water systems in the United States. In green here, it shows that it does not cover private wells. It's something I'm sure everybody knows. Um, it also doesn't apply to bottled water. The FDA regulates that. Um, and s several states have legislation to reduce arsenic in drinking water. Um, so the Safe Drinking Water Act of 1974 um, requires being tested for much more than arsenic, uh, microorganisms, disinfectants, um, disinfectant byproducts, inorganic chemicals, requires red fl uh, lead, lead free plumbing in uh, over 40. <laughs> Uh, organic compounds like benzene, dioxins, pesticides. And as somebody mentioned, uh, uranium in the water, um, radionuclides as, as well, radium, um, which is also a problem in the Northeast region here. Um, so the EPA uh, list of substances that post the most threat to public health. And this is based not, it's based on not only exposure, but exposures that cause the most harm to human health. So it shouldn't be any surprise to people that the number one substance that poses the most threat to public health in the United States, the number one is arsenic, number two is lead, and number three is mercury. And as you know, mercury, um, uh, we get exposed to mercury in high food chain uh, fish, um, in particular certain types of, of tuna. Um, so the World Health Organization and the Environmental Protection Agency said that uh, arsenic is the number one contaminant of concern for human health worldwide. And it's been estimated that over 300 million, 300 million people in the world are exposed to levels of arsenic that have adverse uh, health effects. And I just, rather than list them in, in boring text, I've just indicated some of the, the effects that arsenic has on human health. So this is um, respiratory um, disease. Who knows what this one is? Yes. Breast cancer. Um, enhances the rate of diabetes. This is a hard one. IQ. <laughs> OK. Not everybody has Einstein's IQ, maybe because they drink arsenic in their water. Um, it has adverse effects on pregnant women. Increases the incidence and the severity of bacterial infection. It causes um, 
um, problems with uh, cardiovascular function and, and um, heart uh, disease. And really high levels, I don't know if you can see this, but they, it causes terrible um, um, rashes um, in, you, in your feet, in your, in your skin. Um, so this probably, especially the folks from the Waterville area, um, the Augusta area, um, this is a study that was done um, several years ago, and I think 2014, and um, it's, uh, arsenic was shown in kids, I think, in about eight to six to eight years old, reduce IQ by about five to ten points uh, for Maine school children uh, who were exposed to arsenic in their well water. And that's a lot, five to ten points. It's pretty serious. This is just a map of, um, from the United States Geological Survey that shows um, where they've tested. It doesn't show every area. There are many regions of the country where they haven't tested the well water. But it shows that about two and a half million Americans are exposed to arsenic in well water above the EPA standard of 10 parts per billion or 10 micrograms per liter. And um, I'm going to have to go close to, to read the legend here. But this is um, five, the yellow, light yellow is 5 to 10, the orange is 10 to 50, and the red is greater than 50. And you can all see this is the, the region uh, that we're most worried about, um, the southeast coast of New Hampshire and the, basically the coast, but even some of the northern Maine regions. And you can see there are other regions of the United States where you either have um, orange or red, which exceed the EPA standard. Um, I, I won't mention the fact that also there are certain um, foods that are made with rice, in particular organic um, brown rice, which tends to accumulate arsenic. And it's an interesting story. In the southern United States, they used to add um, arsenic as a pesticide to the cotton fields to, to kill um, pests. And a lot of those old cotton fields now are flooded, and they're used to grow rice. And it turns out when you flood those fields, you solubilize the arsenic. The arsenic just doesn't go away. And then the rice has a certain transporter that transports other things, minerals and everything, into the plant. And it transports arsenic up into basically the husk of, of, the, ars of the, the rice. And so that's why the brown rice is especially um, bad for arsenic. When you make white rice, you get rid of the husk, which gets rid of most of the arsenic. Um, so there are certain regions of the country, mostly rice grown in the southern United States, where those old cotton fields were sprayed with arsenic pesticides that tend to have higher arsenic levels than rice grown in regions that weren't exposed um, to that arsenical pesticide. But I'm not going to say anything more about um, arsenic in um, basically rice syrup um, or brown rice syrup. Um, in 2001, the EPA established a goal of zero arsenic in drinking water and adopted um, a limit of 10 parts per billion. Um, that's down from 50 parts per billion. And that the, the suggestion was made in 2001, but it wasn't um, made a law until 2006. That only pertains to public water supplies. It does not pertain to private wells. Okay, there's, there's no um, rule that requires that private wells be tested. So does anybody have an idea what a part per billion is? I mean, it's, it's amazing. Um, I always have to look at my notes to remember what it is. It's a, one part per billion is one second in 32 years. That's one billionth, one second in 32 years. It's a tiny amount, but it has a tremendous impact on our health, as, as I just mentioned. Part of the problem with arsenic in well water is that it's odorless, tasteless, and colorless. You can't tell that it's there. Now, if you drink really, really high doses, and we're talking, you know, thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of times above the EPA limit, it can be very acutely toxic. 
In fact, there's an old movie, Cary Grant, Arsenic and Old Lace. You know, I'm sure everybody's seen that, the two little old ladies poison people. Uh, it's actually a hysterically funny movie, but probably it's not very much fun to be poisoned by arsenic. Um, so as many of you, I'm sure, already know, arsenic in Maine and New Hampshire well water, about 50% of Maine and New Hampshire residents rely on well water. Um, here are the numbers um, in Maine and New Hampshire, 700,000 in Maine, about 500,000 in New Hampshire. In Maine overall, uh, about 10% of the wells have elevated levels of arsenic. Um, but 42% of Maine wells have never been tested for arsenic, so just about half. Um, and as we mentioned before, um, quite a number of, of wells contained with arsenic, lead, or uranium. Arsenic, um, or New Hampshire used to actually be called the arsenic state. They used to mine arsenic in the state. And you can see, so here, this is the seacoast region, um, which I showed in a previous slide, has a, a fair bit of arsenic. And I think Bo is down here somewhere, yep. right? Okay. <coughs> actually, um, we've tested several wells there um, in, in the Bow and, and in the southern New Hampshire region and found fairly high levels. So Maine, is, Maine probably should also be called the arsenic state. And you can see along the seacoast, um, the slide on the left is um, the maximum uh, arsenic concentration. And this is probably Surrey and Blue Hill, right? Right about here. You can see that it's two cities or towns that have very, very high levels. And this map just talks about the range of values. So right here, that's uh, 500 to up to 3,000 parts per billion in, in these two towns. This chart's a little bit different. This talks about the percent of wells that are above the EPA standard. So you can see, again, if, if, if I pick on sort of um, Surrey and Blue Hill a little bit, that's uh, this um, color code, which is about 50% of the wells are above the EPA standard. What percent? Um, right here in, in Surrey and Blue Hill, this is 46 to 62%. I, I can make this available online for anybody who, who wants it. So the New Hampshire um, Department of Environmental Studies recommends testing wells at least annually for bacteria and nitrates in every three years for arsenic, radon, uranium, lead, and copper. And if any substance is above the recommended levels, um, you should do a confirmation um, before making any uh, recommendations or decisions regarding uh, remediation. So one of the things we talk about all the time is test your water. If you have contaminants, you should remediate. Um, one thing I, well, maybe I'm making the point here, is it turns out that unfortunately, the, the youngest in utero fetuses developing, our children as they're developing, are much more sensitive than those of us in this room to arsenic. And so it's really important to minimize as much as possible early life exposure. Studies that we've been doing at Dartmouth, both epidemiological and sort of lab-based studies have shown that very low levels affect um, the health of fetuses and uh, children. And some animal studies that we've done show that in utero exposure lasts for three generations. Three generations. Now, their mouse studies how applicable they're gonna to be to humans, but to do three generations of human studies would take, what, 60 or 70 years, right? So one in ho five homeowners, um, or, uh, wells in New Hampshire contain unsafe levels of arsenic. The test is about $15, however, in this program, it's free for everybody and your students. Um, it just takes a few minutes to collect a water sample, and as I mentioned before, about three to five years. So this is just, again, to make the point that uh, children are the most at risk. This is actually one of my daughters and my dog, and uh, we care about our dog and our children as well. <laughs> I'll tell you more about the dog in a minute. <laughs> <laughs> so what's in your drinking water? Um, the, the, uh, the question is, is that if you test for arsenic, 
and you find it's in your well water, um, what should you do? So what we recommend is that you immediately um, stop drinking the water, especially if it's above EPA standards. People often ask me, we'll test a sample and it will come back five parts per billion and people say, is that safe to drink? Remember one of the earlier slides that I showed, it said the EPA said there is no safe level. One of the epidemiologists at Dartmouth, uh, Dr. Margaret Carragas, has found the same thing in her birth cohort where she's collected um, samples and studied over 1,000 pregnant moms and their babies. And she doesn't find any level of arsenic that's safe and doesn't have some adverse outcome on infants and young children when they're exposed in utero. So what we recommend is that you switch, you stop drinking that water right away. I don't think any level is safe. Um, and we certainly have done, I mean, the studies done at the University of Maine, for example, show that one part per billion has an adverse effect. It suppresses the immune response to both bacterial and viral infection. And um, um, a zebrafish uh, model, this is work that Carol Kim has done at the University of Maine. So here's an art. This was from, I believe, the New York Times. And it said, should you filter your water? <clears throat> and not only should you filter your well water, but should you filter your public water supply? And many of us in the field think that the EPA rules may be too lenient. Um, and when I say too lenient, it's an interesting story how the EPA came up with 50 or 10 parts per billion. And it turns out that um, about 100 years ago or so, uh, beer makers in England had been using some contaminated um, uh, grain sources to make beer. And they found out that there were very high levels of arsenic in there, and people were dropping dead because it was so high of a level. And they measured it, and they found out that the, the level was just exceptionally high. And so they thought, well, this level is killing people, so maybe if we divide by 100, that will be safe. This, this is actually what happened. And so they dropped the level to 50, because that was you know, the, the number they got when they divided by something like 100. It was, had no basis in science or experience at all. And that level stayed the EPA level, as I mentioned before, until 2006 when they reduced it to 10. And at that time, there was actually, we actually testified both in the, um, the, for the government, state of New Hampshire, and the state of Maine. And there, at the time, there wasn't actually enough data to even inform the decision makers whether 10 would be safe. The only data that existed at that time was data from um, Asia where the World Health Organization had drilled some tube wells into an aquifer that had exceptionally high levels of arsenic into the hundreds and thousands and was causing severe um, health effects. But at that time, nobody knew what the levels, uh, so-called safe or no effect levels would be if the exposure was less like it is in the United States, for example, in New Hampshire and Maine. So that's one of the reasons that our program, um, the program at Columbia Medical School in New York City, and a few other programs, um, one in Arizona, started to look at the effects of very, very low levels. And there's something like 5,000 papers out there now that show that very low levels, 10 and below, have adverse health effects. So because of the well water issue and because of things like the Flint, Michigan problem with the lead in the water, Cape Cod where it, all those contaminates from jet fuel, because of radon, uranium, and all these other things, and because of the fact that public water supplies, although they're regulated, the government allows exceedances. In other words, if a public water supply doesn't meet standards, and then they have a good excuse of, oh, well, we don't have enough money to fix it right now. The government says it's OK. You can exceed the standards. And actually, we don't even know if 
an exceedance has been approved. You could probably go to some website. So I think, and I'll show you some data, that in fact in my home, we're on public water supply. I've tested it. It's fine. But I filter all water that I drink. I filter all water that my dog drinks. Um, because that is the only way that I know that they're not going to be exposed to any contaminant. But if somebody in the group, you know, one of your students or one of the families tests in this program tests positive above the arsenic standard of 10, what should you do? So there's several ways of remediating arsenic. One is called point of use, and that is at the direct tap. So your kitchen sink, your bathroom sink, um, point of use. In other words, where you're taking the water from. And the general guidance is if the level is less than uh, 250 parts per billion, you should immediately um, change to bottled water. Um, of course, one of the problems with that is you, get, you generate a lot of waste um, uh, from either the glass or the plastic. It's expensive. Um, you can use a point of use adsorption filter. There are also reverse osmosis setups that you can do uh, right at the point of use. A water pitcher filter, I'll talk a little bit more about that. And then one of the most important things is you need to maintain and check the effectiveness of remediation. Many times what will happen is people will put a filter in and then they don't check it. One of the um, geologists uh, who works at the, uh, in the New Hampshire United States Geological Survey, he's got a PhD in chemistry, he's a brilliant guy. He bought like an $8,000 water remediation system, he put it in his house and it didn't work. So if a USGS expert puts it in and it doesn't work, what's going on, right? I mean, I was stunned by that. But you have to check how many people have a water filter, like a little pitcher filter, and actually test how often it works, or test the filter, or change the filter on a regular basis. My wife just yelled at me because I didn't change it quick enough. <laughs> yesterday, just yesterday, I hadn't changed it. Um, some of these things will t actually tell you how, you know, the little light will flash or something. Interesting, I remember I said the bottled water is not regulated. We actually tested a number of bottled waters, like our favorite Poland Spring, right? Calistoga had 32 parts per billion of arsenic in it. Holy cow. Yeah, that's what I said when I. So, you know, you buy bottled water. You, that's the problem with well water. You live in a state like New Hampshire or Maine, you think, look, it's beautiful. It's a pristine environment. Why would our well water be contaminated? Well, it's the geology. It not, people aren't dumping arsenic into our well water. It's, it's there naturally. And like I said, it's colorless, odorless, tasteless. You don't know it's there unless you test it. Um, if it's greater than 250 parts per billion, then what you need to do is get a whole house treatment system. That is, where the pipe comes into your house, you need to filter it. And the reason is that when the levels get about this high, um, it can cause skin issues and skin irritation. Remember the, the feet of that person that I showed had all those horrible, I don't even know what they were, scabs or something. <laughs> yes? Um, so the, just like the Brita in the pitcher filter will filter out arsenic? Or? Oh, I'm glad you asked. I'll show you a slide. <laughs> <laughs> so we actually asked that question a couple years ago, and it, it emanated from that meeting that Jane talked about that we had here in the lab. And that is, if you don't want to buy bottled water because of the price, because of the plastic, do these tabletop filters, or you know, sometimes you can put a Brita right on, on the faucet in your kitchen or your bathroom or something. There you go. So <laughs> that's per it wasn't set up, believe me, I didn't set this question up. <laughs> so we, we were asked a lot, well, we don't want to do bottled water, what should we do? So the question is, what's the most convenient and cost-effective way to remove arsenic and other toxins? from drinking water. So we actually did a sort of what I thought was kind of a fun project. We tested five um, readily available water pitcher filters. Um, and I'll show you the results in a minute. And we tested um, 100, 1,000 um, parts per billion. Um, we got some water samples from Bo. Sam Evans-Brown, do you know Sam? He's the 
person in NPR. He's one of the people that does the news and stuff. Um, his house had 55 uh, parts per billion. Um, Sam said it was OK if I told you that. <laughs> <clears throat> so we tested all these, and we used well water. We used arsenic solutions that we made in the lab. And this is what we found. And I'm just going to show you. The, this was a paper we published in 2016. Uh, so we started with 1,000 parts per billion of arsenic, and we studied five filters, zero water, pure Brita. I think everybody's heard of these two filters, um, Home Depot and Walmart. And zero water um, took all of the, uh, the arsenic out. It, was, it actually went from 1,000 to one part per billion. Um, you can see Pure brought it down to around 700, Brita to around 750. The Home Depot and Walmart uh, took a little bit out. Uh, so the zero water was incredibly effective. And we, we tested all different kinds of water and changed hardness and softness and pH. And uh, the zero water tended to take it all out no matter what kind of water we, we, we used. Did that include uranium? Did you test for uranium as well? We did not, but I'll show you some slides on that. So I just want to make sure everybody knows I don't have any financial stake in Zero Water or any of these water pitchers. And unfortunately, it, Zero Water is a private company, so I couldn't buy stock before we published the paper. <laughs> nice. <laughs> um, anyway, it's um, so it not only takes where uranium is here somewhere. So. This is a, a test that a private um, company employed by Zero Water did, comparing Brita with um, um, Zero Water. And as you can see, the Zero took about 99% of the arsenic out, and the Brita took between 2 and 11, depending on the species. And that's exactly what we found. Um, I'm not sure uranium is on here. Is it? Did you see it? I don't see it there. But I would expect that it would, since it's taking all of these elements measured. It's taking about 99% out. The interesting thing is, is it also takes a lot of pesticides out, almost all of it. Um, Brita, you know, this one, like Endrin, takes 88% out. But others like, uh, I don't even know what this is, Cabofurin, it only takes 17% out. I have no idea what that is. <laughs> And then it also takes um, inorganics like chlorine, nitrate, uh, fluoride, chlorate out as well. So it's, it's, it tends to do a much better job than um, the other commercial filters. Just recently, uh, two companies released two new filters. I actually have them downstairs in the lab. We've done some testing on them, um, but we haven't done a thorough enough analysis of them yet. Um, I have one other question about the zero water filter. Yes. Does, has the EPA evaluated it at, at all? So the EPA has not. In fact, that symposium that Jane and I um, attended and we, we sponsored here, there was actually somebody from Consumer Reports. And I, wanted cons I tried to get Consumer Reports to do that. And I followed up with them for years. And they, after a while, they stopped answering my emails. Um, the EPA is not responsive either. Um, Zero Water actually hasn't gotten CLIA certification that their filter takes it out. The two filters downstairs that I have, they are certified by some agency um, that it takes it out. But it's surprising to me that neither Consumer Reports nor the EPA are interested in testing the commercial filters. And the other interesting story is I had to submit that paper to five different journals before they, and I'm not talking about sending it to Nature or Science or you know these really sort of high impact uh, journals. Nobody would touch it because we were evaluating commercial filters. Um, and then finally, I called an editor, actually one of the people who attended our symposium. And I talked to her about the importance of it. And now they recommend that the Zero Water, this is the, the Columbia program, uh, Ana Navas Asien. And they recommend that they, when they go out to communities, they recommend if you don't want to use bottled water, you can use this filter. But, Lori wanted me to point out, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, Catherine wanted me to point out 
that we don't recommend that you use either bottled water or the pitcher filter forever, that you get either point of use or point of entry um, to make sure. And the reason is, is that if you don't change the filters regularly, they don't work after a while. Yes? I was just curious as to, there must be a type of filter, or maybe not. I mean, the filter that Zero Waste uses is significantly different or of a different kind of filter, and is that connected to the kind you are going to be testing? What is it about that filter that makes it work? Yeah, they're, they're all proprietary, so they don't actually tell you. If, if you go back um, to Zero, this is from Zero Water's website, they talk about you know, they have a coarse filter and then a multi-layered system and then non-woven. <laughs> but they don't actually tell you. So I'm, I'm a consultant for three companies um, that are trying to develop uh, similar kinds of, of water filter. And I, they don't even tell me what's in it. And I have a confidentiality agreement and they won't tell me the chemistry. And even if they did, I wouldn't understand it. <laughs> so they're very protective of their proprietary um, rights. But for example, um, iron will actually absorb um, arsenic, but there's two t species, arsenic-3 and arsenic-5. It just has to do with the valence for you chemistry teachers. And um, the iron takes out one form but not the other. So that's why something like a five-stage filter uh, is needed because to take both types of arsenic out of the drinking water, you need to have more than one um, type of chemistry to, to do that. And you can see here, they sort of make nice colors for you. Bruce, is that why you said that if the house has high iron, it should have a point of entry and not just a point of use filter? Is that why? Is that why? So many wells that have <coughs> high um, arsenic also have high iron. Mm, mine did. And iron, so remember at the beginning I said the USGS guy got a, a point of entry filter and it cost him like $8,000 and it didn't work. And the reason it arsenic. didn't work, it didn't work for arsenic. And the reason it didn't work is that the iron clogged the filters and messed up the ability to take. So he had to put a pre-filter on to take the iron out first. <clears throat> And then downstream filters, he had a reverse osmosis system to take out the arsenic. So it very much, and that's why you have to get all the things in your water tested for the water quality specialists who will come in and do the remediation to tell you exactly what you need. Um, because it's not one size fits all. It depends on the species of arsenic. It depends on iron, what Michelle just asked, and what else is in the water. And that makes it hard. And one of the things that we did when we reached out to communities and started talking about this, people come back and say, my well just tested for 50, what do I do? And I started going on the website, I started talking to well water people, the remediation people, and everybody I talked to gave me a different answer. And it was very confusing. And so it, 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 I think that's one of the hardest things, trying to help people select something that, that's going to work. And that's one of the impetuses that we looked at these, these filters because we thought this would be an easy, quick, and the advantage of this is you can actually recycle those filters. Um, and they, I think you can see it right here. There's a little thing here, there's a little blue thing here, and it, it looks, it's about the size of this pointer. And it's basically a conduct, conductivity meter and you can stick it in the water before and after and it tells you whether it's taken out um, stuff. And it works quite well, actually. Um, and then you can test to see when it rises above a certain level, then you should replace the filter. Um, there are other things, like Brita has a thing where lights go off at certain you know, X number of weeks or something. But it doesn't do it by water volume. It does it by time, which doesn't kind of make sense, because you could do like one liter a year and, <laughs> or one liter a minute, right? <laughs> What's the question? So the testing that's going to happen with the water that we're sampling, is that going to give people enough information to tell them what they should do, or if they have arsenic, they have to do further testing from another source to find out all the stuff that's in it? Right. So, you know, that's one of the things we have to think about, because we can, we can tell you everything that's in the waters, you know, whether it's iron, uranium, because the, the mass spectrometer that we have can, can interrogate all of those. 
but I'm not sure giving all that much data to our students would be a, a good way to go. I guess my recommendation would be, and maybe this is something that we should all talk about as a group, um, give them the arsenic data and then have them confirm that. Remember I said the first test you should get a confirmation. Then maybe they should go to a private lab and get it confirmed and then as you brought up in your question, they can look at what else, and then they can consult um, a company who can help them decide on what kind of, of remediation, whether it's a point of use, a point of entry, whether they need an a, a iron pre-filter or something like that. So a lot of the things that I talked about then led to um, the collaboration, as, as Jane mentioned, between the biological laboratory here in Dartmouth. And the idea is to research and do things like this program to raise awareness and education. And as Jane also mentioned, we started off a couple of years ago with the EPA grant um, that many of you participated in. And um, these are just some of the results from the early studies that we did that many of you in this room um, participated in, and you can see that there were um, Blue Hill, for example, um, the average uh, level of arsenic was in the 20s, um, and then New Hampshire Pinkerton Academy, um, it was below five, the average level. But the interesting thing to me was, have you tested for arsenic before? Um, this is from Jane and Duncan. 24% um, said yes, 35% said no, and 41% said they didn't know. 